Welcome viewers to another edition of the Colonel Speaks. The killing of Iranian general Qasem Soleimani in a US drone attack earlier this year marked a new turn in hostilities between the two countries to which Iran responded by attacking two US bases in Iraq. While both sides seem to be stepping carefully to avoid an escalation, but the complex geopolitics of the region is such that crisis was never far away. Today, we will analyze the US Iran standoff and its implications for India, especially since India has had traditionally strong affiliations with Iran and at the same time it has been having a strategic partnership with the United States. Hello and welcome to Bigger Than Five with me, Rida Fakhri. The tense standoff between the United States and Iran continues following the assassination of Iran's top general, Qasem Soleimani, in Iraq earlier this month. Iran retaliated by striking a U.S. military base in Iraq. And now, while both sides seem to have stepped back from the brink of direct confrontation, they face mounting criticism at home over their handling of the situation. Last week, U.S. President Donald Trump justified his decision to order the killing of Iran's general, claiming that Soleimani posed an imminent threat to U.S. embassies in the region. At my direction, the United States military eliminated the world's top terrorist Qasem Soleimani. In recent days, he was planning new attacks on American targets. The U.S. decision to assassinate West Asia's most powerful general, Qasem Soleimani, who was a commander of the Kurds force of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which handles Iran's military operations abroad, has ratcheted up decades of simmering conflict with Iran. The outrage was so intense that Iraq asked US to get off its land, which was followed by a million-man march on 15th of January 2020. The Iraqi XPM Adil Abdul Mahdi said that Soleimani was in Baghdad on Tehran's response to Riyadh's message on diffusing regional tensions when he was killed. In response, on 8th of January, Iran attacked two US bases in Iraq and caused substantial damage. However, the attacks, though being highly precise, was orchestrated to avoid fatal casualties. What we are witnessing today in respect to US-Iran relations, the seeds of which were sown way back in 1953. Here's a little glimpse of the history of US-Iran relationship so far. In 1953, British and American intelligence agents orchestrated a plot to oust Iran's democratically elected prime minister, Mohammad Mossadegh, and restore the autocratic king, the Shah, to power. Pro-royalist mobs roamed the streets battling Mossadegh's forces to a standstill. Mossadegh had nationalized the country's oil industry, which had previously been controlled by the British for almost 50 years. The young Shah, on the other hand, was much more willing to bend to Western interests. That mob that came into North Tehran and was decisive in the overthrow was a mercenary mob. It had no ideology. And that mob was paid for by American dollars. And it was the United States only a few years later that helped Iran set up its first nuclear technology. Fast forward to 1979, when protests led by nationalists and leftists, and later co-opted by the religious right, filled the streets of Tehran. After months of demonstrations, the U.S.-backed Shah fled the country, and religious leader Ayatollah Khomeini declared Iran an Islamic Republic pushing out nationalists and left-wing allies in favor of anti-American conservative social values. In November that same year, a group of students stormed and occupied the U.S. Embassy in Tehran, taking more than 50 Americans hostage for over a year. The United States cut ties and then went on to back Iraq after it invaded Iran, which led to a bloody eight-year war that involved chemical weapons and left nearly a million people dead. It was the bloodiest confrontation in the history of the Middle East. Both the revolution and the hostage crisis are seen as a direct response to American interference in Iranian affairs and would go on to set the tone for relations between the two countries for decades. This picture tells it all. Then in 1983, President Ronald Reagan labeled Iran as a state sponsor of terrorism after a suicide bomber targeted a U.S. military base in Beirut, killing 241 American troops. The truck was packed with more than 500 pounds of TNT. Three years later, while Iran and Iraq were still at war, the Reagan administration was caught selling weapons to Iran and using the money to fund rebels in Nicaragua. 
violating both the government's own policy of not negotiating with terrorists and a series of laws designed to prevent American support of the Contras. This was a mistake. Then you have Iran Air Flight 655. In 1988, towards the end of the Iran-Iraq War, a U.S. naval ship mistakenly shot down an Iranian passenger plane, killing all 290 people on board. The U.S. has always said it was an accident, but many Iranians don't believe that. Things started to get better in the late 90s, but it didn't last. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil. When the U.S. invaded Iraq in 2003, it further complicated the power struggle between Iran and its regional rival, Saudi Arabia. Then in 2005, Iran elected a new controversial leader. During his time in office, tensions over Iran's nuclear program hit an all-time high. The international community feared that Tehran was working towards developing a nuclear weapon, so they imposed harsh sanctions that crippled Iran's economy. Despite that, Iran has continued to be locked in a proxy war with Saudi Arabia, backing various militias across the Middle East. Fast forward to 2013, when moderate Hassan Rouhani came to power on the promise that he'd revive the country's weakened economy. To do that, he needed sanctions lifted, so right after his election, he resumed negotiations with the U.S. and other world powers on Iran's nuclear program. Obama even called Rouhani the highest level of contact between the two countries since 1979. That set the groundwork for the Iran nuclear deal, signed in 2015 between Iran and the U.S. and five other world powers. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It was a historic moment, but then 2016 happened. President Trump has always made it clear he absolutely hates the Iran nuclear deal. The fact is this was a horrible one-sided deal that should have never, ever been made. And when he pulled out of it three months ago, he said Iran would suffer. We will be instituting the highest level of economic sanction. Any nation that helps Iran in its quest for nuclear weapons could also be strongly sanctioned by the United States. After the U.S. withdrawal from the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA, the U.S. has imposed several new non-nuclear sanctions against Iran. The Trump administration called it the biggest sanctions action the U.S. had ever undertaken against Iran. The penalties include oil, shipping, and banking industries. In August 2018, the Trump administration, while reimposing the sanctions, warned that anyone doing business with Iran will not be able to do business with the United States. Iran will no longer be able to buy American dollars. It won't be able to trade in gold. Aluminium and steel are also on the list, as is the country's currency, the real. It's time for more sanctions on Iran's oil industry, shipping and insurance, and the central bank. Iranians are, are very frustrated and angry. Their protests morphing around the country. This has been ongoing since December and January. Um, and, and the government has very limited tools to really protect itself. Um, from the domestic instability, of course, they can always crack down. Uh, but they're in trouble, and, and this is going to be a, a tough period for them. This is precisely what Mr. Trump wants. He says the nuclear deal did nothing to curb Iran's behavior around the Middle East. Its support for militant groups in Lebanon and Gaza, its involvement in the wars in Syria and Yemen. The nuclear deal's other partners, the Europeans, Russia and China, are desperate to keep the deal alive. They still think it's the best way to stop Iran from developing nuclear weapons. But what can they do? There is very little that the Europeans can do uh, to save the JCPOA. Uh, so the governments are standing together in solidarity, but what they are not able to do is compel uh, international companies to maintain their presence and visibility in Iran. Uh, so many European and international companies are withdrawing from Iran to protect themselves from U.S. sanctions. Mr. Trump thinks Iran will ultimately come back to the negotiating table. And I have a feeling they'll be talking to us pretty soon. But so far, all we've had is a lot of heated rhetoric on both sides. If Donald Trump is trying to change Iranian behavior, it's not happening yet. Iranians have accused the United States of duplicity and of violating international law for energy on an agreement it reached not just with Iran, 
but with five other major powers Britain, China, France, Russia and Germany. All of them still support the accord and its validity was reaffirmed by United Nations Security Council resolution. Iran's economy was badly affected for several years by sanctions imposed by the international community. In 2015, agreement on the JCPOA deal was reached following which Iran's economy bounced back and GDP grew to 12.3%. The reinstatement of sanctions by US in 2018 caused the GDP growth rate plummet to minus 9%, which was primarily due to the drying up of foreign investments and oil exports. At the start of 2018, Iran's crude oil production reached 3.8 million barrels a day, with 2.3 million barrels being exported primarily to China, India, Japan, South Korea, Turkey, Taiwan, Greece and Italy per day. Once the waiver on oil imports expired, the oil output dropped and so did the exports. Now coming to the implications for India. India has been doing a fine balancing act since some time now, since it has exceptionally good relations with both. US happens to be a major strategic partner towards India achieving its rightful place as a global player and also has been a traditional friend of Iran. Therefore, the position taken by India is likely to avoid taking sides. Iran's Chabahar port is an important part of the regional strategies for both India and Afghanistan as it gives India the passage to Afghanistan and Central Asia to counter the growing Chinese influence in the Arabian Sea. In Afghanistan, if India has to stay significant, it is inescapable thus that it retains the Chahbahar Zaraj Dalaram connectivity. It is a certainty that India can't access Afghanistan through Pakistan. Therefore, the other option is through Iran. Not only is this option non negotiable for India, but if Pakistan refuses US transit facilities through its territory to Afghanistan, Chahbahar Zaraj Dalaram option becomes the only viable option for the US as well. India has been developing a strategic partnership with Iran that is broadly part of India's plans which it calls Extended Neighborhood Policy, which provides India the opportunity to engage and connect with the Central Asian countries. India's rapidly developing economy is thirsty for energy which Iran has been providing. India's relevance to US as a strategic partner bears out of India's military and economic might, which is dependent on getting its energy needs fulfilled. However, with the US sanctions on crude imports from Iran, which is the second largest exporter of crude to India, it would definitely not augur well. Balochistan's sharing of border with Iran has a direct bearing on India's moral and political support for the Baloch freedom struggle, which gives India political depth against Pakistan. Finally, Iran has always provided support to India in all Islamic forums against Pakistan's misadventures which India has always valued with utmost sincerity. The only exception to which has happened in recent times when Iranian Foreign Minister criticized India on its implementation of CAA, which was followed very shortly by a tweet from the Iranian Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei, which is a visible sign of a slight crack in the India-Iran relationships. The implications on India, while seemingly local in nature, has also a direct bearing on the US-India strategic partnership which the powers be need to understand. If you appreciate our effort in bringing this topic to you, then please like, share and subscribe to our channel, The Colonel Speaks. Jai Hind.